Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 16th of July, 2021. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 19th of July, 2021, with me, Michael Hewson. Um, before we get started, I think it's a good idea to look back at the events of the past few days, because I think one thing that we can say is that despite the fact that we've managed to see new record highs for the likes of the DAX, the Stock 600, the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, I sort of get the impression that equity markets are performing a little bit of a dance in the, in the form of two steps forward and one step back. And ultimately, if we actually look at what markets have done over the course of the past few weeks and days for that matter, they're not really going anywhere. We seem to be in what I would call a little bit of a no man's land or a corridor of uncertainty. Um, if we look at the DAX, we look at the, the FTSE 100, we can see it here with the FTSE 100 chart. Um, we haven't really gone anywhere. Um, since April, we've made a marginal new high in June, just above 7,200. But more broadly, we've pretty much been trading 7,000, 7,200. You pay your money, it takes your choice. Um, and while for a jobbing market, that's quite nice. In terms of overall direction, I think it speaks to an awful lot of uncertainty about what's likely to come next. I think the lack of follow through that we've seen on this week's new highs in Europe, as well as the US, um, appears to speak to uncertainty about a trifecta of factors. And I've mentioned that in my various notes this week. These, these, these factors are continued increase in Delta variant cases, the pace of recovery, which appears to be slowing, and concerns that the rise in inflation may well not be as transitory as central bankers would like. And we've certainly seen that in the underlying inflation numbers, um, PPI, CPI from the UK and the US this week, UK inflation at two and a half percent, well above expectations. US CPI at 5.4. Um, again, and core prices at the highest level since 1991 in the US. Then we've got PPI, which generally tends to be a forward indicator for CPI, 7.3% in the US final demand. But even with excluding energy and food, still above 6%. And I think these concerns that central bankers are underestimating the outlook for inflation have seen a little bit of a shift in some central banks this week. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand, for example, has announced it's ending its asset purchase program on the 23rd of July. The Bank of Canada has said that it's reducing its asset purchase program. And yet we have. Jerome Powell this week saying that the Fed is a long way from seeing substantial progress when thinking about altering a monetary policy. Well, obviously, he has to say that. But when you've got inflation trending well north of 5% and likely to go higher, how confident can you really be that all of what we're seeing is transitory? and not more persistent. Now, for the time being, bond markets are buying that narrative. We can see that with respect to the US 10-year. What's notable here is though that we haven't seen new lows. So could that be a turning point? If we look at the two-year, it's a similar sort of story. When we look at the US two-year, we've come off the highs, but we're still around about 0.2, So. Um, I think it also speaks to a truth that what does the Fed mean by substantial further progress? Because substantial further progress can mean different things to different people. Um, you know, what could it mean in terms of a change of circumstances? Central bankers appear to be flying by the seats of their pants. And no one is suggesting that they set out a timeline for raising rates. But given where the economy is now, given the fact that both in the US and the UK, the vaccinated outweigh 
the unvaccinated, there's no reason to suppose that the same levels of stimulus that were needed a year ago when the economies were on their uppers is needed now. And that, I think, is the important thing that really we have to look at. Bank of England this week, um, two members of the Bank of England, Deputy Governor Dave Ramsden and External Monetary Policy Committee member Michael Saunders have articulated their unease at what appears to be happening with inflation, saying that the case for considering the pairing back of some stimulus measures is rising. Well, that puts the August MPC meeting as a live meeting. And it's rather strange that it takes the departure of Andrew, Andrew Haldane, chief economist, who was way ahead of the curve when it comes to expressing concern about the tapering of asset purchases, to suddenly these two guys to suddenly pop out of the ether and suddenly express their concerns about rising prices. They are there. You're certainly seeing it, particularly in the latest inflation numbers of rising food prices, rising clothing prices, supply chain considerations are starting to um, feed into an overarching narrative that inflation is starting to move higher. Now, central bankers can ignore it. They can absolutely ignore it. But the fact of the matter is, I think with the UK economy where it is, with the US economy where it is, I don't think cutting back on the amount of asset purchases would be um you know would be the wrong thing to do you can't keep the current pace of monetary policy in place now that brings me neatly on to the european central bank now there is one central bank that ain't raising rates or cutting back um, its asset purchase program anytime soon but even of itself that offers problems uh, and we can certainly see that i think in terms of how the euro could well perform over the course of the next few days and the next few weeks. And the meeting is important. The meeting is important in the context of comments that ECB President Christine Lagarde made earlier this month. Not, you know, we've already heard that the ECB will be changing its inflation mandate in an attempt to try and give itself more flexibility over monetary policy. Its previous mandate was to keep inflation at or below 2% over the medium term. Now, its new mandate gives the central bank a more flexible and dovish inflation target of 2%, more akin to the Federal Reserve, though you'll never hear the ECB admit that they're adopting a more Federal Reserve type inflation mandate. For me, I think it's really a change of style over substance. The ECB hasn't been able to hit its inflation target for the last 10 years and isn't likely to. Um, the, the inflation, the latest inflation numbers at 1.9%. It still remains very subdued. Now, there is very much more of a demand problem in Europe than there is, say, for example, in the UK and the US. And that's why I think European inflation is that much lower. But we're going to get a little bit of um, light shed on comments made by Lagarde earlier this month about the PEP programme, the forward guidance, an upcoming policy shift on the forward guidance on the PEP program. Now, currently this sits at $1.85 trillion. It's due to run until at least March 2022. And there's already been significant pushback about the fact that it's, uh, that it needs to, you know, it needs to end there. Lagarde's comments suggest that it's probably going to last an awful lot longer and get pushed out maybe to September 2022. Now, there is likely to be significant pushback on that, given where the European economy is now, given where Delta COVID variant cases, how quickly they're rising and how far behind Europe is in terms of the vaccination stakes. And that would mean that we're likely to see um, pushback to that. And I would suggest that any decision on that is unlikely to be unanimous. So the ECB rate meeting on the 22nd of July is um, the, the key item that I have my eye out for this week. We've also got flash PMIs from France and Germany on the 23rd. We've got UK retail sales on the 23rd. We've got UK flash PMIs on the 23rd. So all, all the key economic data comes at the back end of the week, the 22nd and the 23rd of July. It's also 
a significant week for earnings. Um, it's been a big week for earnings already. US banks have posted some fairly decent numbers, all with a common theme, disappointing FIC trading. But overall, equities, wealth management um, has done fairly well. One other factor, though, has been fairly subdued loan demand. And I think that you know people are making, making a big thing of that. And I think certainly in terms of businesses, that is a concern. But I think with US consumers sitting, an awful lot of US consumers still sitting on their stimulus checks, I think the fact that loan demand is low is probably not the big deal that an awful lot of people make it out to be. Just because you're not spending your stimulus money doesn't necessarily uh, mean that the economy is starting to slow. Uh, having said that, retail sales numbers, US retail sales numbers have been patchy over the course of the past few months. So it's difficult to tell where the US economy is right now. Um, we know that the US economy um, has over 9 million vacancies. We also know that the US participation rate is about 7 million lower than pre-pandemic. Now, a good number of these workers may have well have retired early. They may have dropped out of the labor force completely. The fact is, there's probably a little bit of slack in the US labor market, but we really don't know how much there is. We don't know how many people will return to the labor force after the emergency stimulus benefit measures end in September. And I think that's what makes it so difficult to really know what the inflation, what the underlying inflation outlook is with respect to the US economy and where we are in terms of the overall economic recovery story. And that's before we even start to consider the infrastructure plan, the Biden infrastructure stimulus plan, and what, and what that could give to the US, and US economy in terms of a significant uplift. So that's the picture over the course of the past few days. And it's a picture that is likely to continue over the course of the next few weeks and months. So what does that mean for stock markets? Well, I've already talked about the FTSE 100. We've got a nice little trend line coming in through here. I think there's fairly decent support between 69.80 and 7,000. And I think while we're above that, then I think the range trade is likely to continue. And in essence, I'm still of the opinion that the FTSE 100 can move higher. In terms of the Germany 30 or the DAX, as we like to call it, we're probably going to finish the week broadly flat on the week despite those modest new record highs of earlier this week but even if we do fall and this is Thursday's big falls we still remain well above these this series of lows through here in June 2021 and obviously in July as well so I think the July lows um, which correspond with these lows here are likely to be um, a key support going forward and as long as we stay above those key levels then you know despite the the moves towards the downside that we've seen um, they generally tend to get fairly quickly reversed it's a similar sort of story when it comes to US markets here you know we've seen an awful lot of chop from the record highs of earlier this week um, but nonetheless we still well above that 4,300 area. And I think that for me, I think is going to be the key level. 4,300 also coincides with that trend line there. So in terms of keeping an eye on any dips, that is the area that I'm looking for in terms of the S&P. The NASDAQ, that's, a, that's quite a nice line and it's respected that so far. Three highs around about here, 15,000. The 15,000 level, that's likely to be a bit of a psychological area, but if we can make gains above that, then we could well head towards 15,200. But it'd be interesting to see how the market reacts back near 15,000 if and when we get back up there. The Nikkei 225 has seen a significant outperformance, underperformance rather. And I think with the Olympics coming up and the fact that I'm still trying to figure out why they're even taking place. Um, given that there's a state of emergency in Tokyo and that Delta, and a large part of the Japanese population still remains unvaccinated. I just think that's an accident waiting to happen. Nonetheless, the, um, the Japanese economy um, is struggling 
the Bank of Japan downgraded their growth forecasts for this year while moderately raising the inflation forecasts. I don't know what I'm more worried about than raising their inflation forecasts or cutting their GDP forecasts. Given how benign inflation has been, maybe I should be concerned about inflation. But there we go. Um, it's been a mixed week for currencies. I think the best the, the best performing currency this week has been the Kiwi, obviously on the back of that surprise move by, by the Reserve Bank of New Zealand in ending their asset purchase program starting the 23rd of July. And I'm wondering if that's um, the first domino in a row of central banks who are considering pairing back their asset purchase program. Certainly the mumblings or the murmurings from Bank of England official, officials speak to a direction of travel on that point. That being said, we hasn't really affected the direction of pound. We're still respecting this upward line on the CMC sterling index. We've seen euro sterling make fresh new lows, but what we haven't seen is a significant breakout on euro sterling. And I think a much much of the reason for that is probably as a consequence of this resistance level through here on the CMC sterling index, which is well worth looking at in the overall, um, you know, in the overall scheme of things when it comes to looking at sterling strength. Um, and that's no more better borne out by these moves here in euro sterling where we broke below 85.30, but we haven't really followed through that much. And even if we do, there's still fairly decent support at around 84.80. But I'm still of the mind set that Euro sterling line of least resistance is very much a sell the rally mentality. And actually, we can probably draw in a trend line through these peaks here to give us a better idea of where we are when it comes to the trend on the Euro sterling chart. Okay, so that's that's Euro Sterling, Euro Dollar, with the ECB meeting coming up this week, this coming week. Um, again, we've got fairly decent support on Euro Dollar. It's a bit like watching paint dry this currency. Um, it's certainly not affording us too much in the way of trading opportunities, but um, what we can tell from this particular chart, I think, is that there's fairly decent resistance anywhere near 119 and fairly decent support in and around 117 and a half. Anything, I, can't, I can't really, I don't really see too much happening apart from that. And then looking at the dollar index, CMC dollar index, looking fairly well supported above 960 here, likely to see further gains on that over the course of the next few weeks, even as the euro starts to weaken because it's, we're, we're talking about the direction of travel now when it comes to central banks. And given recent narratives that are coming out, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England look more likely to take asset purchases than does the ECB. So I think that's what you have to bear in mind when you're looking at currency pairs more broadly. OK, so let's move on to earnings. It's been a fairly positive week for earnings, all told. Um, I think the big question more than anything else, is whether or not this is going to be the high watermark when it comes for profits and whether or not Q3 is going to be anywhere, you know, anywhere near as positive as expectations have been when it comes to Q2. So I'm going to start, I think, with EasyJet. Now, airlines have had a rotten week this week. We've got the economic reopening uh, coming up on the 19th of July, I've got to say that the it's, it's reopening in all but name. It seems to me that the onus now appears to be on private individuals and businesses to decide what works when it comes to mask wearing and entering and exiting premises rather than the government mandating it, which seems a little bit of a cop out um, more than anything else. And all it does, all it does is it basically, um, you know, creates um, a very multilateral way of doing things. Um, vaccination, two thirds of the population, the UK population is now double jabbed. Um, yet we still have 
infection rates rising and hospitalization rates are now starting to increase, though not by anywhere near the extent that we saw back in January, February, despite the fact that infection rates are probably at similar levels. But you've also got to bear in mind that we're testing an awful lot more people than we were back in January and February. So uh, the real rate of infection in January, February was probably an awful lot higher because an awful lot of infected people probably weren't even being tested. So, you know, you have to put the you have to put the infection rates in the context of how many tests are being administered. That being said, and the uncertainty about um, where to travel, how to travel, um, amber lists, red lists and green lists, we've seen EasyJet shares get a little bit of a clobbering along with the rest of the sector. Now, um, there has been some talk that fully vaccinated people might, but might not have to quarantine after traveling and double jabbed people also may not have to self-isolate from August the 16th, but um, that doesn't change the fact that um, air passenger numbers are still markedly down from where they were pre-pandemic. And all of those hopes of a summer holiday boom appear to be um, significantly misplaced. And that means that we have to reassess the likelihood of what I would call a return to normal for air travel. Now, now for, for now, EasyJet's got unrestricted access to £2.9 billion of liquidity. It's raised over £5.5 billion since the start of the pandemic. However, the sector remains a long way from any semblance of a return to normal. Um, and really, it's just a question of, you know, how well these Q3 numbers are likely to be. Um, they expect it to fly around 15% of its 2019 capacity for Q3. That means that the airline will have seen three quarters of capacity below 20%. And it's unlikely the upcoming Q4 will probably be any better as we head into winter and the weather gets a bit colder. So, you know, I think there is a risk we could come all the way back here, 700p. And really it's just a question I think now, you know, what does 2022 bring us? Because I think 2021 is gonna be a write-off. And the markets are, I think, starting to price the prospect of that very possibility. Um, we've also got Royal Mail Group done very, very well this year. As we can see, we're not quite back at the levels that we were back in 2018, but we certainly wiped out all the pandemic losses. Uh, it proves a very solid year. Full year profits last year came in at 726 million. Higher operating costs have been a concern for Royal Mail. Um, this is a weekly chart we're looking at. Let's look at a daily. Just quickly change that. There we go. Got slightly out over its skis, I think, in terms of the way the price has moved over the, since the beginning of the year. So it could be it could be due a little bit of a pullback towards its 200-day moving average as the current move looks slightly overextended. This week's Q1 update is expected to see May volume slow a little as more people venture out as the economy reopens and consumers shop from home less. So you may see less parcel volumes in this quarter, given the fact that the last quarter we are pretty much confined to our homes. So that's Royal Mail. Oops, a daisy. Just uh, put that back there. Okay. Um, going to talk about Netflix. Um, that's going to be a particularly interesting number, I feel. Um, in terms of subscriber growth, user growth for Netflix, um, let me cast your mind back, ladies and gentlemen, when Netflix reported its big miss on first quarter user growth in April. Now, you may recall that the shares fell back sharply. That's here. This really shouldn't have been a surprise. Um, I think markets were a little bit over optimistic that Netflix could replicate the explosive user growth of the past 12 months. Um, over the course of the next 12 months. Revenues have been very good. Revenues came in much better than expected at $7.16 billion. Profits came in at $3.75 a share, well above expectations of $2.98. Netflix have been able to increase their prices and it doesn't appear to have affected the growth in their number of users. Netflix is also having to contend with increased 
competition, Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus, the recent merger between Warner Media and Discovery, Amazon paying $9 billion for the MGM back catalogue, the James Bond films, and what have you, for its prime offering. Okay, so these are all the challenges faced by Netflix. Um, what, was, what was particularly disappointing was that um, the slowdown in user growth that we saw in Q1 saw the disappointing user growth, user growth estimates for Q2. Um, one million. That's what Netflix is predicting for Q2. One million new users, well below the estimates of 4.4 million, which markets had been expecting um, back in April. Certainly sharply down from last year's 10 million. But you're always going to get what I would call a little bit of a consolidation, given the fact that last year's numbers were pumped up because of the various COVID lockdowns. Now, obviously, there's been an awful lot of other things to be distracted by over the quarter. Um, tennis, cricket, um, Euro 2000, Euro 2020 rather, football tournament, particularly how well England did. So that's likely to have impacted the Q2 user growth, user growth estimates. Nonetheless, still expecting Q2 revenues to come in around about $7.3 billion. And while the next two quarters are likely to see slightly slower subscriber growth numbers, the second half is likely to see numbers pick up because we've got a whole host of new content or expecting a whole host of new content in terms of new series of Stranger Things, Lost in Space, uh, The Witcher. Also, Netflix have just announced a planned move into streaming video games in an attempt to attract a much younger cohort of users. Um, obviously, this announcement hurt the value, hurt the share price of GameStop, which was quite interesting. So management are still thinking on their feet. They're still looking to grow and diversify. And they also do an awful lot of international content and the market leader there. So I think there are a number of factors to be optimistic about Netflix share price. Having said that, that's in a range as well. We look at the bottom end of this range, we look at the top end of this range, we've pretty much gone sideways. Well, and it'll be very interesting as well to note whether or not management still remain of the opinion that the company will be cash flow positive by the end of this year. Another favorite, Tesla. That's looking particularly interesting and it's also looking particularly vulnerable. Um, gross margins on Tesla cars have been falling quarter on quarter. They came in at 19.2% in Q4, which was the lowest in 12 months. There has been positive free cash flow, but they still can't make any money from selling cars. And competition is only going to get fiercer with from the likes of VW, Ford, General Motors, the China love affair. China's falling out of love with Tesla. Um, Chinese authorities have banned Tesla cars from some of their car parks because of the cameras on the Tesla cars. Um, looking at it's, you know, Tesla's had problems at its new Brandenburg plant in Germany, which now looks as if it's not going to open for production till much later than scheduled. Yes, it is expecting to produce a new crossover SUV model in Austin, but Brandenburg could well take a while to come on come on stream. Profits are still expected to come in around about 94 cents a share, um, but Tesla is involved in a price war, which means that we're going to need to pay particular attention to margins. Um, and I think that that could well, you know, if we, if we get if we get a disappointment there, then we could see Tesla's share price drop below its 200-day moving average and head back towards the lows that we saw in early May. So maybe Musk is starting to lose his um, oh loses maybe investors are starting to lose lose their ardor when it comes to Elon Musk. We've also got Twitter's latest announcement as well. Um, again, um, the big problem with Twitter is um, monetizing its users. It is trying new features. It's experimenting with new products. Um, these are struggling to catch on. Um, at its last quarterly update, um, results for revenue and monetizable active user growth came in short. Now, the company's ambitions are to basically generate 
revenue by 2023 annual revenue by 7.5 billion dollars 7.5 billion dollars they can barely generate a billion dollars a quarter so how they're going to virtually double that is anyone's guess so to justify its current valuation the company will have to really start accelerating how it monetizes its user base now there's been a couple of things that they've done to try and change the way it interacts with clients fleets new products like fleets which was a stories like feature which to be fair i have never used and never want to um twitter has taken the decision to remove fleets so it turned out to be rather fleeting sorry about that um and there's also a new product called spaces so i think unless twitter can harness the holy grail of monetizing as well as growing its user base investors should be prepared for more disappointment when it comes to twitter's latest numbers okay so i think that's pretty much it for this week taken slightly longer than normal uh, to do this particular video but i'd like to thank you once again for listening wish you all a pleasant weekend and i hope you have a successful trading week in the coming week thanks very much for listening this is michael hewson talking to you from cmc markets <laughs>